I talked about asymptotics in one variable. Um, and asymptotics in two variables or more is harder. <laughs> um, if you're going to try to do an analog of the Clement Schmidt sequence, for example, local intersection cohomology comes in. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so instead, I'm just going to focus on sort of results a paper I wrote with Colleen Robles and Greg Grossstein uh, investigating basically using Hodge theoretic linear algebra. Uh, what can happen in two variables? And let me begin with the most naive formulation of the classification question I have in mind. Given a variation of odd structure over S, um, S not a boundary point in a good compactification, that means a compactification by a normal crossing divisor of S. And then imagine that I have a product of K disks embedded here so that. Um, the intersection with S is the product of K punctured disks. And now I consider the restriction of my variation of pod structure to about this boundary point. And I want to understand how this restriction behaves. The first thing is that we can lift this to the upper half plane going into uh, the H that are passing to universal covers. And so what you really want to do is understand the asymptotics of this map, whatever it is. Um, for Calabi-Yau threefolds, I'll just point out <laughs> H is say one, A, A, one. And in that special case, this thing would be uh, a homogeneous variety of the form SP two uh, A plus two R modulo U of one cross U of A. So it's, it's simple to write down. It's a little bit hard to think about because already when A is one, as I said, this is a format, a uh, complex format. Okay, question zero. Can we classify this asymptotic behavior? What does classify? Um, you know, any, any naive approach to this question um, might produce kind of a wild problem. Um, here is one. The problem isn't so wild. You look at the limiting mixed Hodge structures, F infinity, together with this weight monodromy filtration that I introduced before, that depends on the, the monodromy logarithm. Um, and then there are things called boundary components in which these things live, boundary components, classify sort of a repository or a classifying space for possible F infinities or a fixed um, N or W. Um, this may not be an R split, um, but it makes Hodge structure. So you may not have may not have EQP R equals DPQ on the nose. Remember, it may be modulo stuff A smaller than P and B smaller than Q, but you can fix this. And that makes the problem a little bit simpler. Um, you can pass to uh, fix this by using a splitting. So, the splitting modifies this without modifying this. So there's something called the SL2 splitting in some of the literature. There's something called the delta splitting. That's the first one. That looks like this. And you know, there's some element in the Lie algebra of this group that would multiply that e to the minus i delta. This is the element of Lie algebra and apply it to F infinity. There's a nice description of what that does. But at the end of the day, it just makes the thing R split. It just makes this thing true. There's another um, splitting called the SL2 splitting, 
which is more complex. I mean, again, it's multiplying by some e to the zeta times e to the minus del i delta f infinity. But I mean, I can't say more about it without spending half an hour. I mean, it's very complicated. Uh, maybe one can just say that the nilpotent orbit coming from this approximates the original variation or the original nilpotent orbit a little bit better than uh, at infinity. So F infinity hat is the SL2 splitting. Those give slight reductions, either one, because you're passing to R split limit mixed odd structures that cuts down the number of possible F infinities you're dealing with. And you know, you end up with smaller boundary components to record those things. But we can go coarser still. Um, we could pass to the naive limit, f lim, equals the limit as z goes to i infinity of phi tilde of z, which bizarrely turns out to be the, you know, if one wants a description of f dot, then it's not VPQ lim with uh, P greater than or equal to dot. It's VPQ lim with P anything in Z and Q less than or equal to N minus dot. So in the picture where this is the usual Hodge filtration, things like this, the naive limit filtration ends up being like this. It's a completely bizarre little result. Uh, in my paper, one of my papers with Greg Furlstein. Um, and this lives in the boundary of the H. So it's coarser because it lives in the boundary. And you could go even coarser, coarser still. Meaning we're losing more information to get like fewer things that we have to look at in the classification. Um, you could go modulo the action of GR this group on uh, the boundary after passing the naive limit, go modulo the action of GR on the boundary of uh, the domain. And D check, and this yields finite set. That's that makes it a combinatorial question in essence. Okay, that you can solve with Lee theory. We could go even coarser, and we could say, well, just worry about what the mixed Hodge numbers are. And an amazing little uh, result, I guess, is that in the case of period domains, that's essentially the same thing. Um, roughly speaking, what about k greater than or equal to one? We can consider degenerating degenerations. So you can have a variation of Hodge structure on the product of punctured disks. And one thing that we could do is we could just look at the degeneration along the diagonal disk. Alternatively, we could look at the degeneration to one of the axes where just one of the um, variables in these upper half planes goes to I infinity. And then degenerate that variation of mixed Hodge structure. And we haven't talked about degenerations of variations of mixed Hodge structure, just pure Hodge structure, but you can do it. Um, it can be defined rigorously. So you could call this degeneration one, that's the degeneration along you know, just where one variable goes to zero of the pure variation. And then you get a mixed variation together with the weight filtration associated to the N about this axis. And then you do a degeneration of that variation of mixed Hodge structure. Um, and then the question would be, is this two the same as this two? And they are equal. So that those two methods get the same limiting mixed Hodge structure. You could also ask about, um, you know, what, what's the degeneration here, which also has to degenerate to this. Um, but let me formulate a question that will stay with us for the rest of the talk. Um, what limiting mixed Hodge structure types arise 
So that's just the k equals one question. P would be how are they related? Yes, so one question. The fact that you were the same, you mean about Hodge numbers or really the, the mixed Hodge structure as an integral or I, I mean the mixed Hodge structure modulo reparameterization. But yeah, I mean it's formally in terms of of uh, how do I say this? You can state this formally in terms of mixed Hodge modules as like psi s composed with psi t on the variation you started with is the same thing as pulling back the variation and doing psi along the diagonal. Right? So things like so the jump quality of mixed Hodge modules on the point. So, so things like the height jump does not appear in this. Things so like the height jump. Um, right. Um, I thought that the height jump involves some non abelian. Uh, I may not remember exactly. I don't remember how that works out. But it's, it's, a, it's a fact that, that composing these uh, limiting mixed time structure procedures gives this. It's mm -hmm. so one of the Catalian capitals. So, yeah, we can clarify that. Okay, so how are they related? In other words, this is a k equals two question um, about what kinds of pairs um, one and two or three and two can appear. And then what combinations can they appear in? On all faces. Okay, greater than or equal to two question. So here I would use a notation like one, two, three to describe a triple that I want to appear. And you can see at the end of the talk, I'll talk about some triples that actually uh, how to classify admissible triples if you are restricting yourself to um, the notion of types just given by mixed Hodge numbers. One, two, three refer to the previous specification you mentioned in the, in the other lecture. Right? Uh, so one, two, and three would just be however you're classifying limits in one variable. Uh, how can like which triples are admissible in this picture, right? So I have the degeneration along the diagonal here to two. I have the degenerations along the axes to one and three. What triples are admissible for limits of a variation on the pro on the puncture disk squared? So, so that means two can be four. Well, that means two can be. Oh no 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 no! I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't mean yeah. the Calabiao classification yeah. of degeneration. So, notational. Okay, so let me. But one, not three, are the same, right? Because the, you're just the degenerating in one direction, or what is the difference between one and three? Uh, okay. So if these variables are. Uh, S1 and S2. This is S2 goes to zero. This is S1 goes to zero. And this is both of the zero. Okay. So at, at the very least, for instance, I could have um, a genus two curve, and maybe this cycle gets pinched to a point in one, and this cycle gets pinched to a point in three, and they both get pitched to a point in two. So that would be something that you could do. But much more complicated things can happen. And it's certainly not the case that one needs to be the same type as three. Okay. Okay. So let me say a little bit about Hodge variance. It's an important aspect of period maps that um, there are special loci in period maps where, say, some periods go to zero. Okay, um, this is this is related to the Hodge conjecture, right? Because 
what does the Hodge conjecture mean? The Hodge conjecture is saying that if you have topological cycles, which are also of type PP, which is basically a statement about vanishing of some integrals. Like if we're talking about surfaces, then it's just saying that the period against the two zero form is zero at some point in the modulo. Then that Hodge class is supposed to be given by an algebraic cycle. So it's a deep conjecture saying that if something, if some cohomology class behaves a certain way topologically and analytically, it should be algebraic, right? We can extend the notion of Hodge classes to the entire tensor algebra of B. So this means the direct sum over all A and B of B to the tensor A, tensor B dual to the tensor B. If I take A and B equal to one, then this is just endomorphisms of B, right? And so this is saying that if I have, say, a special self map of the Hodge structure V at some point in moduli, then that is what we call an exceptional Hodge tensor, just like a Hodge class is an exceptional Hodge <coughs> class when it appears newly in moduli. So you can imagine I have some period map, and over this locus, maybe I have a special endomorphism, over this locus, I have a special Hodge class, and you can consider the behavior of the so-called Hodge locus, which is usually denoted like this, inside, inside the S on which you have a period map. And you can talk about uh, sort of the expected dimension of the Hodge locus. And if the actual Hodge locus has dimension greater than expected, you call it atypical, and you get into all this uh, excess intersection theory. That's been analyzed using old minimal methods like Ben was talking about yesterday, and he might talk about this uh, later today. Um, one of the big results recently in Hodge theory is that when this acquires exceptional Hodge tensors in an atypical way, then that part of the Hodge locus is a finite union of algebraic varieties. So it's a refinement of the major result from 1995 of Katani, Kaplan, uh, Katani, Delin, and Kaplan that this Hodge locus is a countable union of algebraic varieties inside S. So the way I think about this Hodge locus is it's where um, a certain group, which is the smallest Q algebraic group containing the image of that Hodge co-character that I introduced in the first lecture, gets small, okay? In fact, what I want to say is given Q and phi, um, generic in the image of phi tilde set G to be the Q algebraic group, group closure of phi S1 is the fixator of all of the Hodge classes that you have in the entire variation, okay? And then the Hodge locus is where this group drops, okay? Where it gets smaller if I specialize phi. I'm not gonna talk more about the Hodge locus, but I will use this group. So where does this group come up? If you analyze a family of curve of genus two curves, it's just completely arbitrary, completely arbitrary family of genus two curves. This G will be SP4, okay? But if I analyze, it, it's a genus three curves, it will be SP6. But now suppose I analyze the family of curves Y cubed equals X, X minus one, X minus A, X minus B. This has a cubic automorphism by multiplying Y by cube root of unity, right? These were studied by Picard over a hundred years ago. And Picard and Holtzapfel and Shiga and others developed the picture of the period map for this family of curves, actually taking values in a two ball quotient, so B2 modulo gamma. So you have a period map going into that thing instead of the full SP6 period domain. And this B2 is actually um, a homogeneous space for SU21. So this would be the G in that case. 
and and the, that comes because sort of this this B two is the fixed locus inside the big period domain for this action on periods. I do not want to erase this. So, sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so um, now back to this complex multiplication thing. I, I, yeah, it's very complicated if it's on the elliptic curve. But yeah, if you have an elliptic curve, then the complex multiplication points are exactly from yeah. the, 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 this Hodge group. But this then, the if I go group. like for threefold, are these inside? I mean, it seems like we go um, for threefold. Right? Okay, so for an elliptic curve, the Hodge group is either SL2, in which case that's generic, or it's a, tor it's a one torus, in which case the elliptic curve has to yeah. And the period ratio of the elliptic curve is imaginary quadratic. Those are the two possibilities. For threefolds, there are you know, many possibilities for what this group could be, say inside SP6. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rich. Even so inside SP4 for 1111 odd structures, it's pretty rich. Um, so our classifications of these things are so interesting. I just want to introduce this sort of this general uh, point of view because it's actually better to think in these terms even in the period domain case for some purposes. So they're trying to think just about period domains. Just take an arbitrary Hodge group, take a homogeneous space for that. That's my classifying space for Hodge structures. What can we say about that? Okay, so the picture here then is I have my period domain. Inside that, I have the orbit by the Hodge group of my Hodge structure. And I'm gonna call that just D. That's isomorphic to GR modulo in compact. And then I can look also at the compact dual. And inside that, I have the GC orbit of the corresponding Hodge filtration. That's going to be called D check. And again, this is an analytic open subset, the D check. And this is isomorphic to GC modulo of parabolic. So this is a nice, these are these projective homogeneous varieties. People computing quantum cohomology. They're very well studied. Um, when k is equal to one, it's k equals one question. The monodromy, of course, is in G of Q. Um, and so that means that the monodromy logarithm will be in the rational Lie algebra of G. Okay. So what you do with this is you reduce all of the questions about asymptotics to questions about Lie theory. That's why it's better to think in these terms. And we can also define uh, boundary components parameterizing nilpotent orbits in this context. So you say B tilde of N is gonna be sort of a period domain or a, a Hodge domain. That's what these things are called, Hodge domain. For limit mixed Hodge structures. So how do we define this? We say, I want all F dots in D check such that e to the zn f dot, this is my sort of f infinity, is in d for the imaginary part of z much bigger than zero. When I wrote that down that nilpotent orbit last time, this is a property that nilpotent orbits all have. So basically what I'm saying is I want all of the f's in d check, which together with some n yield a nilpotent orbit. What else do I have to have? I have to have transversality. So I need n to hit f dot and send it into the next flag down at worst. So my first paper with Greg Perlstein was to say as much about these things as we could to present them as like homogeneous spaces of a sort and um, iteratively fibered varieties over a Hodge domain like this and where the fibers are recording extension classes of mixed Hodge structure. Now, if you go to our split mixed Hodge structures, if you're happy to work on the level of those, then there's uh, a smaller set classifying the possible limiting Hodge flags. Um, so what you want is you want Z goes to E to the Z and F, say the Z, to give 
an SL2 equivariant embedding of H, the upper half plane, into D. That's called an SL2 orbit. So in other words, I want to have some row, a group homomorphism from SL2R to GR, such that theta applied to theta at gamma of I, this is the action of SL2R on a point of the upper half plane, equals rho of gamma applied to theta of I. So that's what the equivariance is. And this is the same thing, it turns out, as those F and D checks, such that F dot, together with the weight filtration of N, which I formally have to shift like that, is R squared. Okay, so what I've done here is I've completely translated classification of R split limits with this monodromic logarithm into a Lie theory question. Okay. And you can refine this question a little bit now. Sort of how do the extra Hodge tensors, how do the extra Hodge tensors or more general Hodge domain setting. Having extra Hodge tensors is a constraint. How do they, how do the extra Hodge tensors constrain the answers to Q1? So now let me give you a general framework for answering this question. So I'm going to ignore rational structure at this point. I'm going to translate this entirely into leaf. I have my D check inside that. I have my D, and then I have the analytic closure of D in D check. I'm just going to think about this and the fact that um, GR acts on all three of these objects. Is some classifying spaces for odd structure, and I don't care about the variation. So I'm going to consider these BR of n's classifying R split limit mixed Hodge structures, or R split milpotent orbits, if you will. By, and I'm going to take their disjoint union over all n in the milpotent cone of GR. So these are just all milpotent elements in GR. That disjoint union, I'm going to give a name, BR tilde of D. And you know, given any element in BR tilde of D, F dot N, I can do one of two things. The obvious thing is to send that to N, to forget the F. And that gives a map from BR of D to the milpotent cone of GR. But there's another map that we have seen. I can take the naive limit as z goes to i infinity of e to the zn f. And where does that live? That lives in uh, that lives in d check. So I have this map here. Now, as I said, gr acts on everything in sight. In fact, it acts equivariantly on this whole diagram. And so that means I can quotient by GR. And that gives me, I'm just naming the quotients, psi D, O, and N. And well, this may not surject, so let me give different names to the images. O, D, these are sort of the, if O is the set of orbits of GR and D check, then O, D, is the set of Hodge theoretically accessible ones by a naive limits, okay? And same thing with uh, ND. These are going to be the GR orbits of Ns that actually underlie no-potent cones, like underlie non-empty sets of open cone, of no-potent orbits. Okay. 
So Fn, there has to exist an Fn to map to n down here. Um, okay, so again, these are Hodge theoretically accessible things. I'm gonna call, call, call them the polarizable boundary strata. Just because they come from variations of polarized Hodge structure. Um, and these are the polarizable, uh, and here is a notational travesty, no potent orbits. So Lee theorists call a no potent orbit, the orbit by GR of a no potent element, right? Hodge theorists call no potent orbit, this thing. It's terrible. <laughs> so we have two different notions of no potent orbits. Anyway, these are all finite sets. So we can ask, I mean, it looks like this would be really difficult to compute, right? But Lee theorists know how to compute the number of orbits, right, of GR in D check. Or, I mean, this is really, this is going to contain one element, which is D, that's a GR orbit. And then orbits in the boundary, right? Because my variation is just doing something like this, or maybe going to an interior point. I mean, it can only hit things on the boundary of D and D check. So this is some finite set. Might this be a bijection, allowing us then to compute and completely classify no potent orbits in this sense? And the answer to that turns out to be yes. So that's the first theorem uh, in my paper with Carlstein and Rose. Um, there is also a notion of order on O and N. So let me say what that notion of order is. O1 is less than O2 if and only if O2 is contained in the closure of O1. Okay. The idea is that you're sort of doing a family of no potent orbits that are then going to degenerate to a more degenerate no potent orbit. So you have this sort of this is more degenerate than this. And then it's the opposite for n1 less than or equal to n2. This is, these are definitions. If and only if n1 is contained in the closure of n2. Okay. So then this gives rise to question two. Somewhere it won't be lost. Question two How close are all this phi limb and pi to being projections? B is there a, I mean, they're post sets, right? Is there a related post set structure on D? So what is the, what is the motivation here? For me, the motivation was to elucidate the combinatorial structure of polarizable no potent cones. Um, in other words, abelian subalgebras, sigma. N1 up through NK in milk of GR for which there exists a sigma no potent orbit. This is the Hodge theory, sigma no potent orbit. So what does that mean? That means a theta from HK to D check 
with z going to e to the sum of zj nj f, where three things have to hold. F dot is in D check. Transversality assumption, nj f dot is in f dot minus one. And theta of z1 of zk is in D if the imaginary parts of the zj's are all large. Okay. And this is equivalent to the existence of a variation of Hodge structure over delta star of decay with N1 and K as monodromy logarithms. Okay. And let it make Todd structure. E F W. And if this is, if by this I mean the limit mixed Todd structure at the center, then this n should be the sum of the engine, or at least something in the interior of the car. Okay, so I have what, 20 minutes left? Ish. Okay. Um, all right. I want to summarize my Hodge-Deline diagrams with a function that sends PQ to HPQ infinity. Okay, so if you if you have a mixed Hodge structure, you have a delta because it has these m. And I want to let delta H, that's not delta, it's a diamond. So for Hodge diamond, um, delta D. So delta D, diamond D is going to be the set of all deltas arising for limiting mixed Hodge structures of delta star to D by gamma. So, so far what we have is we have GR equivalence classes of pairs F comma N. F infinity comma N. Going to GR orbits by taking the naive limit of the corresponding Milpunk orbit. Then I can go to Hodge delete numbers. Naive limit has the same Hodge delete numbers as this. And these are contained in the Hodge delete, the possible Hodge delete numbers for Hodge structures on the period domain, the Lewin mixed Hodge structures coming from the period domain, just because D is contained in DH. Okay. So this is the picture that we want to understand. So what are some general results about this? I'm gonna quickly say some general results in this setting and then I'm gonna do the period domain setting and tell you what this crazy diagram is. Okay, so Colleen Robel solved uh, Q1 prime, that means in the general Hodge domain setting, uh, A. Uh, it's a little bit, I wrote out the details, but I think uh, I'm not going to give uh, everything that is written here. So, what she showed is that there is a bijection between something called L of D modulo the action of the vial group of, remember we had in our D, uh, GR modulo H, 
if I take the Lie algebra on H relative a compact maximal torus, um, she showed that there is a bijection between this and psi D. And the way this is computed is in terms of certain like Levy um, subalgebras compatible with a choice of Cartan sub subalgebra. Um, it, it produces a finite set. It's very computable. In fact, if you draw the root diagram of the Lie algebra, you can compute this. Thing. Um, and what does she do? She basically takes some Levy subalgebra, puts um, an SL2 triple inside this uh, Levy subalgebra, and that gives sort of how to say some kind of hot structure inside D, and then she applies a Cayley transform and that gets you to the boundary, of D, and that gives you your R split F infinity that you need to get a pair in here. And then she does some transformation on the SL2 triple that gives you your end. So it's very natural. There's an explicit map from here to here, but I don't want to go into it. Um, and one thing that it does is there's a natural way of putting what appears to be an order on these Levy subalgebras. It's a little bit, again, it's a little bit complicated to say. It's up to the action of the bio group. And it's not exactly that one is contained in the other. It's a little more complicated. The problem is it doesn't exactly yield a null set. And this is your first hint that there is some trouble with it. And in fact, one is never going to get a null set structure on side in general. For Galabi Yaws, it's a particular problem. Maybe you can say again what a poset poset structure is. What a poset structure is, it's a partially ordered set. So it's a relation that tells you like whether two el one element is greater than or equal to another if they there is a relation between them at all. Um, and A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, then they're equal. You know, if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C, transitivity. Transitivity is really the thing that can fail. So in other words, if you have a degeneration from type A to type B, and a degeneration from type B to type C. Does there exist a degeneration from type A to type C? Not always. That's the trouble. Okay, so the way we started thinking in the paper that we wrote uh, with Perlstein is we said, let theta be a sigma equals R greater than zero, N1 of NK, no potent above it. We want to understand its you know, asymptotics in various directions and how they're related. And so I'm going to take CK to be the K cube poset of faces of this cup. This is just the power set on one up through K. Um, and now we apply applying phi lim, the naive limit map, and pi, the thing that forgets F and goes to just N, to the sub nilpotent orbits and faces of sigma. Yields a little diagram like this. CK goes to ND, goes to O. So here I'm, I'm taking naive limits and directions in the cone. Here I'm taking the just the sum of ends in a direction in the cone. And you could ask, since psi D has projections to these things, does this map factor through psi D? In other words, do we get a relation of of this type on the levies that Colleen used to uh, put a relation on this from every relation in this cube, right? So this whole diagram comes from a, a, a single nilpotent orbit. Um, and so the question is, if we have a relation here in the cube, do we have a relation here among the nilpotent orbits? And the answer is yes. Okay, so 
the first theorem in our paper essentially is that there exists uh, a dot 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 factoring diagram. Um, and so that means um, all uh, relations are compatible. I phi lim and and uh, let's see. Moreover, phi lim. phi lim is a bijection. I mean, this also made use of this levy technology that I didn't want to get into over here. Um, okay, so now what you do is you say, well, I have a relation on this. I also have the relations that come from these nilpotent orbits via this p map, right? I know that for every relation here, there's a relation here. Call the relations here that come from a nilpotent orbit, give them a special name, call them a polarized relation, like so, okay? And then you could ask, is this a post set? Again, the answer is no. But something really nice turns out to be true. And this astonishes us. And it comes straight out of uh, the paper on multivariable SL2 orbits by Katani, Kaplan, and Schmidt. And what it says is that all polarized relations um, are realized, the things that are that come from an arbitrary nilpotent cone are realized by um, multivariable SL2 orbits. Okay, that is huge because you can classify multivariable SL2 orbits in the same way that Colleen classified SL2 orbits. That's computable. You can do that on a computer. Um, there would be no way of doing it if this wasn't true. So it's basically saying that I can start with an arbitrary nilpotent orbit and normalize it, which does crazy things, right? You start with some nilpotent cone generated by N1 and N2. Katani, Kaplan, and Schmidt is going to mess this up. It's going to relate, it's going to keep your N1 but replace N2 by some N2 hat. You don't know what it is. Okay. You do know what it is. But it's hard to compute. But still, it's the case that this thing uh, induces the same relation as, as this thing. That's basically our problem. It's, it's not that complicated, but it's too tricky to explain. Okay, so that actually answers question 1B in the more general, in the more general case. Okay, so what do these things look like in a more down to earth setting where we can get our hands on everything? Last section. Period domain case. Um, so here we define our diamond to be all those functions from z cross z to z such that delta of pq equals delta of qp equals delta of n minus q n minus p. The sum over q of delta pq is equal to hp n minus p and delta p minus one q minus one is less than or equal to delta pq if p plus q is less than or equal to that. Then you know what I'm going to tell you. This is a very simple result. It says that psi, uh, let me just do it for odd weight. It's easier to say. Psi dh, so all sort of the gr 
classifications of uh, SO2 orbits equals ODH. Those are the polarizable boundary strata um, in the boundary of D that you check equals diamond DH equals what I just called diamond H. So Hodge numbers and the, the standard constraints on the Hodge numbers of a limit fixed Hodge structure completely classify the possible SL2 orbits in that case. And moreover, the degenerations of degenerations, if we write delta alpha um, of PQ equals sum as L goes from zero to M, sum as J goes from zero to L of PL, P plus J, Q plus J. Okay, so what does this mean? This means exactly that you're going to write PLs for the primitive parts in the mixed Hodge structure, which is like the tops of the N strands. And then the adding the J just means that you're creating the rest of the N string. So if I have a given mixed Hodge structure in terms of the Hodge numbers that's given in terms of these primitive parts, then we have the delta alpha is less than or equal, sorry, polarized relation. We can actually uh, get from al alpha to beta by a degeneration of mixed Hodge structures, if and only if delta beta is sum as L goes from zero to N, sum as J goes from zero to L of delta L P plus J, Q plus J with delta L <coughs> in diamond uh, H of L for all L. Um, and what does that mean? These things have Hodge numbers. These are Hodge structures of weight N plus L with Hodge numbers H of L. So what is this saying? This is saying that if these delta Ls are admissible degenerations of the PLs, then this whole thing is an admissible degeneration of this whole thing and vice versa. In other words, any admissible degeneration of the primitive parts gives you an admissible degeneration of the fiction. So now let me come over here and tell you in plain English what this means. Consider this mixed Hodge structure, right? Just look at the picture. What are the primitive parts? The primitive parts are this and this. And so now I'm going to tell you that I'm allowed to move this bullet up and this bullet down because that's an admissible degeneration. And then I could keep this constant. What happens if I do that? I get this picture. Okay. Because this bit here came from degenerating that primitive part, and I haven't degenerated this primitive part. So that's that's basically the move. Isolate the primitive parts, degenerate them as an admissible degeneration of pure hot structure. And, and that's what you can do in the period domain. And that gives you the answer to be in completely concrete terms for period domains. And so let's look at a few examples. Here I've taken genus G curves or G-dimensional abelian varieties, and this is supposed to be what their H1 looks like, right? H10 is G and H01 is G. So I'm allowed to move bullets up and down so that they are symmetric about these two diagonal and anti-diagonal. So there you see, I've let my genus G curve acquire a single node going from here to here. And then I acquire two nodes and three nodes and so on and so forth. And I end up with something that is quote unquote Hodge Tate. It's one, one and zero, zero and nothing along the original way one, one. Okay, this is a linear order. That's pretty nice. So we get a linear order on side D. Now we go to a weight two example. So I start off with Hodge structures of type 2B2. And as you can see, I can degenerate in these, in these directions. The, these arrows mean that I can take any composition of these arrows, and that's still an admissible degeneration. So transitivity does hold. In other words, um, you know, this is still an arrow and so forth. All right. 
So that's the picture there. It's a nice partial order. Partial order. And Colleen and I studied contact domains, like all of the possible contact Hodge domains, and showed that they enjoy a partial order of this type. Now all hell breaks loose. One, two, two, one, which is not that complicated uh, weight three type of Hodge structure. The yellow arrows are the only admissible degenerations. In other words, you cannot say, I want to compose these two things and degenerate in that direction. From that mixed odd structure to that mixed odd structure. Um, you can't, uh, well, okay, wait a second. If you're starting from zero, I guess I should have actually drawn these other two arrows. Everything is an admissible degeneration of, of the pure thing. But uh, you cannot compose all of the arrows. Uh, in particular, let's see, I wrote it down. You can degenerate from four to five and from five to seven. But what you cannot do is degenerate from four to seven. That doesn't work, okay? The, the problem is that what are your primitive parts? Your primitive parts are this and this. You're allowed to move those up and down. Indeed, that gets you from four to five. You're not allowed to move these up and down because they won't then have the property that the numbers increase towards the anti-jag. You won't have an SL2 string. So this cannot do anything. Until you put a bullet in here, you can't degenerate that. And so you cannot directly degenerate from four to seven. So that is to say, to get my order right, you have polarized relations four, five, seven, but four to seven does not work. And so to fix this, we sort of introduced, we forced a partial order on it by mapping these, these two cubes or N cubes more generally into these diagrams. And then those things have a partial order, but that's too complicated for the story to relate now. Um, what I'll just point out is you can classify with this enumeration exactly what the SL2 pairs are that come, that are the types that arise in an SL2 cross SL2 um, uh, homogeneous embedding of the upper half plane cross itself into D. And there are these four types. But then there are several other types that you get by taking certain admissible triples. Like each pair, three and seven, has to be a pair appearing along one side of an SL2 pair. But the combinations of the three of them don't have to come from SL2 pairs. And so that was sort of another thing that we realized in writing this paper, that once you have the possible you know, pairs that arise in the SL2 context, you can try putting them together in different ways and ask if they're admissible. And we write down a Lee theoretic criterion for deciding that, uh, which is again, rather complicated. Um, but let me end with one statement. So Kato and Usui had formulated this theory of partial compactifications of uh, D by gamma. And there were never any examples beyond the toroidal ones that everyone already knows from the Ash, Rav, Port, Mumford, and Tai toroidal compactification story um, and compactifications that have only one dimensional nilpotent cones. The problem is that when you start with some nilpotent cones in the boundary of a variation and you start applying gamma, the monodromy group to them, they can have self intersections. And this can happen infinitely many times in principle. There's no proof that it can't happen infinitely many times. And then you're screwed and you can't have it. You don't end up with a house door of compactification by applying the other story. So uh, my student, Halva Deng, in his PhD thesis, uh, studied a one, two, two, one variation, which comes from, I mean, it's a little bit complicated to say which one it is, but it comes from you know, complete, interse complete intersection in P4 cross P4, and then taking the mirror of that. Um, it was studied by Hosono and Takagi in several papers. And what my student showed um, by replacing the S uh, that Hosona and Takagi used for their variation by a bi bi rational equivalent S. Um, 
he was able to prove the existence of a fan uh, consisting of all of the orbits of these monodromy cones that actually makes Kata Usui's story work. So far, there were only counterexamples like saying you could never do this. Um, but let's see. The cones that actually arise are not so uh, interesting from this classification standpoint. They are, I believe, seven, 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 maximally uniform monodromy in all directions. One, seven, seven, and uh, one, two, one. So that's sort of a maximal conifer. Um, I think uh, he's currently working to try to extend this to not just a single variation that gets compactified <clears throat> by its image in this kind of Usui gadget, but to do it in general, uh, given certain types of cones. Okay, with that, I thank you for your attention. So, so coming back to the classification um, story, um, it, so you showed essentially that this whole classification can be done in the SL2 picture, right? Yeah. And the SL2 picture is very clean, right? It's yeah. just raising lowering operators and yep. it, commuting and pairs of SL2s. Commuting pairs of, pairs of SL2s and so on. So uh, what is the complicate where, where is the complication hidden in this picture on, on this order, for example? Can you is that easy to see or well I mean you see and, okay, I mean, yeah, I mean, you see what all of the possible polarized relations are that are given by these yellow arrows, and then you just see that it's not transitive. Yeah. It's bizarre, but that's, that's the way it is. And I, I mean, I, from the explanation I gave here, it's quite clear that you can't do a degeneration before to uh, before yeah. the but, but I don't understand exactly why you cannot make this movement in the sense that you can only move two dots every time because no 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 you, you, can, a... you can only move you have to it has to work on the level of the primitive parts okay right so uh, a hot structure of type two zero plus zero two cannot degenerate okay so the point is that you have to take the primitive part and you have to only work with this primitive part yes in some sense. you have to work okay. with the individual primitive parts and those are the possible one variable degenerations like keeping that tight away from the and then in zero the point is that everything is doing so now you can move everything and you can go directly to seven yes moving everything yes. Yes. exactly so you sort of trap yourself by going before mm -hmm. okay. it's like a board game or something. so if one wants to put this on the computer for arbitrarily high cubes but then it's not any more cubes any cube I mean, the, then, then, then I think it's, it's, it's maybe the really bizarre thing is like you, we had, we showed there are examples where, for example, you, uh, you have like SL2 to the fourth, like there exist, you know, at most SL2 to the fourth orbits, but there exists no potent cones um, that are seven dimensional and irreducibly so. So I think this was true for the F, like some F4 Hodge domain or something like that. And, uh, you know, so that's saying that by looking at kind of small dimensional variations of SL2 type, you can, you can reconstruct these like much larger dimensional things um, by, by using the sort of relations that you, the polarized relations that you get from the multi SL2s and then putting them together in different ways um, while uh, obeying the rules in that last section of our paper, which are quite unintuitive and complicated. I don't know what to say. Maybe this is a more question for Thomas, but in terms of your picture, this distance conjecture, any of these are just infinite distance, right? From the original. 
uh, uh, like no, that. it depends on what the types are. Oh, so this wouldn't be infinite distance. This wouldn't be infinite So how do you know that? So what is he going to So the, so everything which is type one is not infinite distance. And this is exactly uh, as we just pointed. Yeah, so it, only if the dot, the upper dot, moves to the side. It to, you know. So just to make sure I understand, in, in, your, in your language, all of this would be an infinite distance. Yeah. So then I guess I'm wondering if like, as I said, sort of, you could start by looking at the bottoms of end strings and stuff like this, stuff like this. Yeah, this is exactly what we do. Yeah. So then and that the, stuff, the period should vanish and the cycle should vanish. Okay. So, so now the game is to, to, to find for each of these uh, diagrams of for each of these structures, the states which, which become asymptotically light. And these are the ones which are below the diagonal. And then the Anything next thing what you have that. to show is that there's a lattice of such states. And you see that this is actually true. So you would you would include also this, even though it's mapping to here. Exactly. I mean this this will still have a log period. So that's you very nice. Know. So you can even take this one and then you can act with the monotony n times and you generate a whole lattice of it you, you get a whole multi-dimensional lattice of states and they come from it precisely and interestingly they all all the ones which are at infinite distance have exactly such a lattice mm -hmm. so even in the one modulus it still is unclear how to find these special Lacanian and break lattice this is and one of the main Exactly. So then, then either you construct them in the geometry explicitly, or you you do some analysis with attractive flows, or you, you show kind of stability of these uh, of the states. And I think the technology is there, and that people are thinking about this, uh, like Aaron Palkin, but uh, it's it's not fully established. And then there is another direction, which uh, the Hamburg group is pushing, uh, Timo Weigand and Wolfgang Lerche and uh, And they, um, you want to even understand better what exactly is shrinking. What is the geometry of the thing which is shrinking? Uh, and what does the, what is the physics associated to this limit? And this depends on the precise geometry. That's why I asked before, what is the status of understanding very generally, very abstractly of what, what type of Lagrangians are shrinking? How do they intersect? What is the property? Because depending on these precise properties, the physics will change in the limit. Well, I, I would say it's a, in order to have any chance at getting a general answer to that question, you have to work with some stable generations. And every degeneration obviously has a semi-stable model, like semi-stable production. We know, for example, that if you put string theory in, on some sort of semi-stable degenerate uh, space, then often there exists another string theory which describes the same picture. And then the, the idea is that light states in the distance conjecture have a meaning in this physical change from one to the other picture. Okay. Sketch. Is, is it clear how do isotopic classes of, of Lagrangian relate to, to these Hodge classes? Because I mean, there is this Joyce Thomas Zell conjecture about if you have the isotopic class of a, of a Lagrangian, mm -hmm. then whether you can they form it in the in the specific class to a special but this is a, I mean this is a very hardcore question which has not yeah but you can represent your your rational cohomology classes by Lagrangian cycle Lagrangian three cycles and so everything you see in here if you're just working on the level of the weightful friction 
uh, then describe things in terms of the weight filtration and in terms of the action of N. That's all rational. You could describe that in terms of some spectral sequence relating to the strata of the semi state generation. So that's, there might be some. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's not that far away from establishing some of these results. But I think special Lagrangian, really the special property, it's, yeah. it's not trivial that these things exist. And then for Calabria four folds, then it gets even more complicated because then these are four cycles, and then you need the Hodge projection to get the cycles. <laughs> Any other comments? Thanks, Mark, again.